What do I need to be good at? To be great at something. Hello, everyone. You are listening to She Leads with Carly. And in this show, we talk to the absolute best, brightest, and yes, badass leaders. Tap into where your natural curiosity takes you. Just making sure you're not your own roadblock. Even if you do fall, you're going to fall and you're going to learn. Together, let's build a DNA of what it takes to rise to the top and truly make an impact. I'm your host, Carly Malatsky. Hello, everyone. I am super excited to welcome our guest today, Audrey Wish. Audrey is the founder and CEO of Curious Cardinals, an ed tech company committed to empowering K-12 students to discover and pursue their passions with the guidance of college mentors. Audrey started Curious Cardinals as a freshman at Stanford University, where she was pursuing a bachelor's degree in history. Just one year later, the COVID pandemic hit, and Audrey ultimately decided to take a leave of absence from Stanford to pursue Curious Cardinals full-time. Today, Curious Cardinals is a global community of over 500 top college students mentoring kids across the globe. Audrey has spoken on CNN, The Today Show, and in Forbes to share her vision to create a community of lifelong learners and doers. And she was also recognized, deservedly so, in the 2022 Forbes 30 Under 30 Education and Youngest category. Audrey, it is such an honor, such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me today. Of course, of course. Okay, so Audrey, I want to know who were you as a kid? Who were you even, where did you grow up and what type of, you know, child were you? Um, I grew up in New York City, born and raised. I am a third child. And so, you know, learning from your siblings. Um, apparently, I'm not the third child archetype, um, but I've always been, it's funny, recently we just found, I was looking through old documents. I found the goals I set in, as a 10th grader. And I sent them to my mom and my co-founder and was like, I have not changed. Oh my God. Have changed in every way, but also am so the same. I had goals I set for every class in school, for friends, for my clubs, the debate team, track, um, health and sleep. So I've always been a very goal oriented person um, and a very bubbly, energetic person as well. I love it. Also, Audrey, you beat me to it. I actually talked to Alec, your co-founder, and he mentioned how you found your 10th grade goals. So tell me a little bit about them. What what were some of the goals that you had from an academic standpoint and then also, you know, maybe outside of school? What were some of the goals? The goals were, it was everything. I was a big track runner. I was a super competitive runner. I thought I was going to run in college. It was times I wanted to hit. Um, it was prevent injury. I had gotten injured several times. It was the grades I wanted to get and stay focused, get ahead. Don't be down on yourself. It was surround yourself with people who bring out the best in you, treat others the way you want to be treated. Um, everything from like values and like who I wanted to surround myself with to very tactical. I want to run this time on the track. I want to win this many debate tournaments. Um, so it was a range, but I guess it was a reminder. I almost forgot like, wow, I've always been a pretty goal oriented across all aspects of my life individual. That's incredible. And it seems like that motivation was very much instilled in you. It didn't, did you have that pressure from whether it's your siblings, your parents, did you have it externally or was it more just, you know what, this is who I am and I, I, I'm setting this for myself. It has been who I am. I think especially being the youngest, I looked at what others were doing. I, I looked at what my parents were doing and I kind of figured out I, whatever I put my mind to, whatever I spend my time on, I want to be the best of the best. And I also want to be really passionate and around people who energize me. Um, And so when I was little, I was a big dancer and tennis player and soccer player. My email was like dance tennis soccer girl at Yahoo. So I've always been someone super passionate. um, And definitely I think having a passion um, has been a North star and also finding people that I look up to and want to be like one day has just been something, I don't know if it was me being a third child or what, but it's kind of been ingrained in me since I was little. Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. I also relate, you know, I'm a third child as well. My email was Carly Love Soccer, L-U-V-S. So anyway, I totally understand that. And so 
ultimately that hard work, that motivation very much, you know, you, you saw the fruits of your, of your labor, if you will, you got into Stanford, you attended Stanford and you chose to study history. Like I said, so before we even get into, you know, what happened a year later, walk me through, what were you seeing, you know, for your career long-term? What did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be the next Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I was incredibly passionate about social justice. Um, in high school, that probably came from debate and the community service work I did. I think growing up in New York City, it's it's impossible to not to not acknowledge the um, vast array of humans that make up the city and life experiences. And I was not lost upon me how lucky I was to have amazing parents and food on the table and a loving, warming family that valued education and was there for me and an amazing education experience I was able to go through. And so I felt really committed to equity and access. Um, and so I also, I think through debate was thinking about it more through a political lens. I thought that law would be kind of the sphere that to make the greatest impact. Um, and I had constantly, since I was younger, I remember in high school being like, do I want to be a teacher and impact 20 people? but go really deep? Or do I want to be a Supreme Court justice and impact a million people, but a lot smaller impact? So I was always thinking about kind of the scope of my impact and the number of people I wanted to impact and the pros and cons of either or. Um, and so I thought I wanted to be like an immigration or criminal justice reform lawyer. I was obsessed with Brian Stevenson. I read his book, Just Mercy in high school, and it like changed everything for me. Um, I created an independent study at my high school to learn about the history of um, Mexican immigration because wow. being in high school with Trump as president, it was impossible to neglect the very negative rhetoric surrounding immigration and immigrants. And I was like, my grandparents were all immigrants. We all didn't come here originally. You have our immigration stories. And isn't that what makes this country so beautiful, especially New York City? Um, and so just kind of dug myself into those fields and was really passionate about pursuing that long term. So when I came to Stanford, I was like, I'm going to be a lawyer. I have my 10 year life plan. Um, I want to make an impact through law. I thought that law would be a vehicle to make the greatest impact. And inevitably, I'd have to support or champion an individual that I was representing. So I would have that individual connection. But bringing that to the Supreme Court, the outcome of that could impact millions of people and have a systemic difference. So I was really passionate about kind of championing individuality, supporting individuals, but having a systemic impact with the work I did. And given all of that, right, it sounds like entrepreneurship never really seeped in per se. Like, do you have any entrepreneurs in the family? When was that almost first introduced to you, if at all, before Curious Cardinals? I will say I have some funny stories. I my dad would always tell me growing up, like, my little CEO, you're going to be CEO one day. And I was like, I'm going to be a lawyer. Um, and I I don't remember this, but apparently um, I told my parent, asked my parents if everything was okay in 2008 because I was reading Forbes on the toilet. Um, apparently they love that story. So apparently, I, and I wrote the tooth fairy that in 2008, they didn't need to give me money because I knew it was a tough year. Um, so I was always conscious about things. And frankly, I was entrepreneurial, running lemonade stands, making movies. I was always taking on projects and running the show. I like my friend and I at a camp, I would always creating things and making things and running things. I was president of the basement in high school and track captain. So I was also like a leader in many ways too. Um, but no, I never called that entrepreneurship and never saw myself as an entrepreneur. And when I got to Stanford, I a little bit started to detest the, I feel like so many people are coming here and are like, I want to be a founder. Like, what does that even mean? Like, I, I want to solve really important problems. Um, and so I felt like there was a bit of a, a, a little bit of an ego attached to it. So I, I almost, if anything, Stanford made me feel further drawn away from entrepreneurship initially. Absolutely. No. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Cause I think you're so right. There's this almost sexiness to it. Right. And that, and then because of that, there's this inauthenticity of it as well. So, so yes, we'll get into that. And it seems like your dad, you know, some, something's right. He definitely has that ability to, to know you. Um, I love that story about the, the tooth fairy. That's an incredible story, by the way, it really tells who you are. And so, like you said, building 10 year plans, like very much being very thoughtful of who you are, the impact you want to make in the world. A year into Stanford, the whole world kind of flipped upside down. The COVID happened. We were sent home from Stanford campus. Walk me through 
your process and what went through your mind and how this almost, you know, was it unsettling? Did it kind of change that, that timeline, if you will? How did you go through that? So as Alec, my co-founder remarked, he was like, you were the most like came to Stanford with a plan. Like every talk that happened in the law school you went to, everything to apply for you applied for. And I, I think I felt part of it was imposter syndrome. Like, oh my God, I'm so lucky to be here. How do I deserve to be here? I need to prove my that I deserve to be here and take advantage of every single opportunity afforded to me by this university. And so I felt really grateful and I felt like with with privilege comes great responsibility. Um, and so, yeah, by the time we were sent home from the pandemic, I felt like I was just hitting my stride. I was um, making meaningful connections, developing meaningful relationships with professors, um, uh, finding new opportunities, getting into summer programs. And I was just feeling like I'm um, I'm shaking things, I'm moving, I, I'm loving it. And so um, was really, I, I was, I'm an optimist. So when they sent us home, I was supposed to be at Stanford for the spring break humanities research intensive fellowship that I got into. And I was like, I'll be back in a week. Um, and we were, yep. we weren't back. And I would say, yeah, kind of like probably one week into being back. I'm like, I can't continue with Abla. I was doing Abla where I was teaching English members of the janitorial staff. I joined that out of my passion for immigration reform, but I was fell in love with the teaching. I loved it. I would meet my learner twice a week at 10 p.m. in the biology building. And it was like the highlight of my week. And I really missed that. So I was like, I should make money. I should start tutoring kids. And so I think I'm always someone who like doesn't let the grass grow underneath me um, and didn't want to sulk and be upset and was like, how do I make lemons out of lemonade lemonade out of lemons do something out of this and not sulk about it because like this is there's no choice we don't have agency over this um so that's initially how that's that's kind of the the experience tutoring i can talk more into that that led to inspiring curious cardinals yeah so did you you ended up moving back to new york i assume right you went back home yeah okay so take me through what was the inception of curious cardinals how did it happen and when were you like okay you know what i think we've caught lightning in a bottle here so started tutoring kids. I was working with a seventh grader and ninth grader on Zoom and felt like they were disengaged and uninspired with what they were learning. And I wanted to make their learning feel like it mattered. I felt like I had my why, I had my North Star that made me purposeful, that made me set my to-do list in such a gloomy time. No one wants to be in their childhood bedroom when they're just getting the hang of things their first year of college. Um, and so I, I felt like that itch to help those students find their why and make their learning feel purposeful. It was such a dreary, gloomy time. Um, and so I started doing that and it was so fun. And their parents were like, she's canceling her Zoom play dates. I, I first just wanted to get my daughter off of TikTok. Now she's reading multi-chapter books outside of school. Um, and then one of them asked for math help. And I was like, I could tutor you in math, but I'm not so passionate about math. And that's what's been magical here is me working with you on things I'm so excited about, like my energy and passion radiates through the Zoom screen. And so I texted Alec, um, who was an aerospace engineer at Stanford and said, like, want to tutor this girl in math? And he was like, sure. And so he started tutoring her in math and inevitably like applying what she was learning in math to how airplanes fly and helping her get ahead and accelerate her learnings. And they, the parents, they started telling all their friends. And so... We were tutoring so many kids out. We were both doing like 21 quarters on Zoom, 20, 21 units on Zoom. Um, that's like the mass amount of, more than the max you could take at Stanford. So we were busy with our yeah. online learning. And um, I'm a super connector. I'm like a compulsive connector. I can't help myself. So someone would come in and be like, I want to learn biology and my kid loves soccer. And I was like, oh my God, my friend loves soccer and he's a human biology TA and you guys would get along so well. And so I just started making these matches. Um, and at first did it just for friends. I was like, do you want to work with this kid? I don't need to be involved at all. Um, and then again, they were telling all their friends, all my peers at Stanford, it felt like a lot of opportunities paused and they were like, we can either make money or do something meaningful. And people felt like there weren't many opportunities to do both. So it felt like this gravitational pull on both sides. And I was doing research for the Stanford history professor that summer. Again, didn't even let myself sulk. I had, I was supposed to go on a Stanford Bing summer program and I was supposed to do some fellowship. I had like a whole exciting summer planned, but I was 
we had this situation. So I applied for a research grant to do research with Estelle Friedman, my feminist history professor from the intro sem I loved. Um, and so Alec had two internships that summer with Stanford. And we were like, let's just do this. And June 1st, which is tomorrow of 2020, um, my older sister helped us launch our Wix website. And we just they were like, this is a fun project. Let's go for it. First of all, so incredible. It, it's really much, you know, like you said, taking the opportunity as it came and just like making the most of it. And so I'm curious, I want you to talk a little bit about the differentiation you you draw between, you know, it's very much not a tutoring company. It's that a, it's that beautiful like synergy between college students mentoring these young kids. And so talk a little bit about that and almost how important it is that you drew almost like the connection of passions like soccer with biology and like how those two kind of came together rather than the almost standard tutoring, you know, let me teach you do a workbook, things like that. Yeah. Well, now we don't say tutoring. Tutoring is the T word at Curious okay. <laughs> because tutoring has a connotation of being transactional, like a remedy yeah. for Friday's test. And the core four pillars of the model are one year peer mentorship, two passion based learning, three project based learning, and four representation matters. So, near peer mentorship, learning from a college student who's not too much older in age than yourself, so they can set out the path to where they got to and make it feel attainable. Our mentors also grew up on social media. They also had their education halted by the pandemic. So we get it. We speak the same language. And my light bulb moment here was when I was working with one of my first students and she read the research paper I wrote that was published in the Stanford Historical Journal. It was like 30 pages and I was so excited. It was published in the Stanford Historical Journal. And she was like, oh my God, Audrey, how did you write this? I'll never be able to do this. And I looked at her and was like, Jane, you are so much further ahead of where I was when I was your age. Imagine where you're going to be when you're my age. And she literally like jaw dropped and was like, and I had this moment of like, oh my God, I looked up to all these people my entire life. I wanted to be the next Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I could barely reverse engineer her path. Um, But it was really meaningful to have these people that were kind of almost like North Stars in a way, these people I really admired holistically as humans. Um, and I could be that figure for her and humanize it and demystify it. Not me yeah. working kind of aspirationally from a social media, which can be a little toxic and unachievable, but really breaking down the steps and instilling in her that sense of self-confidence and belief that she too could do that and so much yeah. more. And I was there for her to tell her everything I wish I knew when I was in her place. Again, you're providing this aspirational vision for them rather than just this person who's, you know, telling them how to add two plus two, if you will. But you're really like showing them this is where you can end up, which is so powerful. Totally. And then the the three other pillars is passion-based learning. We teach in silos, but we live in a hyper interconnected world. And so at Curious Cardinals, we aim to take an interdisciplinary approach to learning. Um, We have academic mentorship and passion projects and academic mentorship. It's all about anchoring the learning and the why. Um, Just as any good leader does at a team, you want to know why your daily actions contribute to the greater North Star or company objective that you're working towards. And if you don't garner that collective buy-in, of course, an employee is going to be like, why am I doing this? Or why does this matter? And we never give students that that privilege, that opportunity to know the why, how what they're learning today is going to help them in their future. Um, On the passion project front, it's the opportunity for students to do really meaningful projects. And if they love sports, learn sports analytics. If they love fashion, learn the business of fashion or fashion and sustainability and helping students imagine the pathway forward they get genuinely excited about. Um, The third pillar is project-based learning. Not all of our engagements culminate in project deliverables, all the passion project ones do, but more so it's the ethos of project-based learning where I didn't take computer science in high school, not because I wasn't interested, but because I thought maybe I'd get a bad grade and it would tarnish my chances of getting into Stanford, which is such a terrible reason not to try something. But so often that fear of failure inhibits students from even trying. And so we aim to detach that fear and encourage exploration. And then the fourth pillar is representation matters. You are what you can see. I was one of the few girls in my honors math class. I lack a lot of confidence in STEM probably prematurely deem myself a humanities gal. And I can imagine how much I would have benefited from a female engineer mentor who also loved Taylor Swift and helped me realize it wasn't about competence. I was totally capable. It was all about confidence and those negative voices that would seep into my head. 
And so whether it's your gender, your race, a learning difference you have, an aspiration to be a college athlete, like maybe little Carly, whatever it is that's most part of your identity, we match you to a mentor you can see yourself in. That's, uh, it's, it's so amazing. And yeah, everything you said, like, it's just so common, especially that point. I think that's so, such a part that's broken in the early education system is counting yourself out or, you know, you have one teacher who told you, you know, you can't do this. And then that sits with you for years, for a long time. And it really navigates what you choose to study, you know, what classes you have confidence in and not. So anyway, it's incredible. And at what point did you actually stop taking classes at Stanford? You know, when did you decide, okay, you know what, we should take a leave of absence. And I'm so curious, what did your parents say, or at least others around you think of that? So that summer we had internships. That July, I I had a personal mentor who um, was a Stanford professor who I was speaking to, and he mentored other um, students who went off to law school. And I was like, so should I intern at the ACLU? Should I do this? And he was like, this thing, this project you're doing sounds pretty great. And what if you're teaching things that you love about law and social justice? What if you do that? And I was like, that's a great, that's a not a bad idea. Maybe I should do that. So shout out to Professor Taubman. Got to give him um, some credit there, though he's not so happy that I haven't returned to Stanford. (laughs) Um, And I am no longer pursuing that path. So I got to connect him to one of my close friends who he has become a mentor for. Um, Amazing. And I was convincing everyone. I I remember vividly the walk I went on with Alec, who became my co-founder and was like, we're going to do this. We're going to take time off. It's going to be so fun. We're going to learn so much. We're going to have an impact. And I literally, and I gathered a group. We moved into what we called the Cardinal Crib. And I like was on the phone with their parents. Like I had two Zoom, like a call and a Zoom with two different people's parents being like, I promise this is legitimate. This is the traction we've had thus far. We're going to learn so much. We're going to make an impact. So I was pitching and convincing everyone that summer of 2020, like, let's do this thing. Um, We were on the, we were on CNN on Sunday night. Everyone moved into the Cardinal crib in LA on Monday. Um, And we first, we thought we just, we took fall quarter off. And then in winter, I actually did the five units you could do and finished my research paper. And then in spring, I did 12 units. Um, So it was, was not thinking like I'm dropping out or leaving. Um, But that spring was when we had that decision of, okay, we've had all this traction. We have learned so much. Everyone's gearing up to return to school. And yes, COVID was the catalyst for this. It exacerbated an existing problem, but emphasis on existing problem. Um, We realized that parents had always been relatively complacent with kids learning. They thought like, well, we turned out okay. And they got a front row seat to their kids' education in the pandemic. And we saw the sentiment change dramatically. They started to think, is this working? Is this right? And so Alec and I felt this um, real instinct that there was a unique opportunity and this unique moment in time we're at the precipice of change and Stanford's not going anywhere and this opportunity could. And so let's give it a little more of us. Um, We're not letting it turn it behind. And as I said, Stanford's not going anywhere. No. And okay, Audrey, I can go in a couple different directions here, but I want to even talk about that co-founder relationship with Alec you know, you are actually more than co-founders, your boyfriend, girlfriend as well. T- tell me about that process and how almost intentional you guys were to say, you know, okay, you know what, we're going to be co-founders. We have complementary skills versus, you know, maybe we should put that aside and focus on our relationship. Like how did that come into being and, and have there been challenges? I, so we were dating first. Never in a million years would I have thought we'd work together. He was yeah. an aerospace engineer as a history major. I had always so admired his passion and his intense focus and ambition. Um, And I know he felt similarly. And it just started as a fun project. I don't even remember when we first called each other co-founders. I do think we realized that we had perfectly complementary skill sets. We respected and trusted one another enormously. And so it just worked. We didn't even need to have the conversation of like who owns what, kind of the embracing those components of building this was so natural and um, definitely wasn't easy. Definitely there's been bombs. I think um, probably the beginning was the hardest because it was such a shift. Now 
I feel like the luckiest person in the world. It's not easy building something and to do it with the person that I love and I trust and I have so much fun with and I get to share this crazy experience with. And we both push each other and believe in each other. Um, it's not for everyone, but I feel really, really lucky that it works for us. It's it's so interesting too, because I recently had Reagan on the show. She's a founder of Aiden and Ana. And for her, she emphasizes she had a really terrible, if you will, co-founder breakup. And so for her, she mentions how you need your own lane. You can't be playing in the same sandbox. And it seems like you and Alec really have your own lane, which is so powerful. And even more so, as you fundraised and you raised money for Curious Cardinals, did that come up? Were investors a little hesitant because of that? And overall, how, how was fundraising for you as you know a woman, Stanford, all of that? We, we don't lead with the fact that we're dating, but we don't hide it to anyone. And anyone who's about to give us money or join our team, we make sure that they're aware up front and have space to, to ask us any questions. Um, for when we first fundraised, um, Anthos Capital that led her around, actually the managing partners, Brian Kelly and Emily White, who are Curious Cardinal's parents and led the round, are husband and wife. So if anything, they were very comfortable with that. They're very familiar with that. They do that themselves. Beautiful. Um, Brian says that he sees that in consumer brands, apparently more consumer brand thing. Um, and that leads to the, the fundraising. We were um, super, I mean, we had enormous traction. Um, we had generated over like 750K in revenue with no capital to start, just the two of us. Um, didn't even realize how much money was in the bank. And when we decided we're going to do this, we knew we needed to hire full-time people who could build this with us. And we knew to do that, yes, we were able to pay them like the first four months, but we needed to raise money. And so it was at first we wanted to raise 750K, then it went up to a million. Um, we reached out to all our first parents and let them know if anyone was interested. And we had no idea that Brian and Emily, who are Curious Cardinal's parents, ran a fund. Um, and we had a first call with them and Brian was like, I don't want to invest 1 million. I want to invest 5 million and we'll do the whole thing. And Curious Cardinals didn't just 2X my son's learning experience. It 10X, it soared so exponentially. He was like, I didn't like driving Uber. I didn't like shopping Amazon. I've never been satisfied with my kid's education, Curious Cardinals. And so that changed the game for us because of course, when one person's interested, especially a incredibly well-respected, accomplished investor, Everyone else suddenly wants to get involved. So we were oversubscribed then and it felt really overwhelming. Um, lots of learning came with it, but I would say having happy customers who saw the power of our model and saw also our hustle, um, that was what enabled us to have the successful fundraise. If we didn't have that, it probably would have been a lot more difficult. Yeah. Um, the other, our other investors that joined Audacious Ventures, um, we did StartX. And so an, an advisor we met through StartX connected us to them. So I think it's like luck is always luck you make. Like you go after opportunities, you hustle, you do the work, you deliver an incredible experience for customers and make your own luck. Yeah. And Audrey, I'm so curious what you think of, it goes back to what we talked about of Stanford founders, right? Founders, even dropping out of school, you hear the glory stories of Mark Zuckerberg and whatnot. What advice would you give a student at Stanford now, or even students everywhere, right, in college who are thinking about making that leap? What would you tell them to do versus not to do? Should they drop out? How, how do you think through that? So Emily White, who's our board member from Anthos, once said, listen to your whispers. If you don't, they'll soon become screams. I, I didn't end up running in college. And I ran a lot my freshman year because I was like, maybe I'll want to walk on the team. And I didn't end up doing that. Um, but I felt like I had so much in my tank and I didn't tap into my full potential. Like I was like, there's so much more of me and so much more of me to this sport that I could have given. And it felt like just like work that was left undone. And I had these like inner whispers, like, I don't want to leave this on the table. There feels like a real opportunity to deliver an exceptional learning experience to leverage technology, to do it at scale. And that, that North Star I started with, of it felt so different at first. I was like, what's happening? I'm not I'm veering off my track. But I was like, at its core, the reason I wanted to be the next Ruth Bitter Ginsburg is I loved individual relationships, but I wanted to do so in a way that would enable a systemic impact that wouldn't just affect one life, it would affect millions. And I realized I was doing that. At its core, Curious Cardinals is about championing individuality, enabling a personalized learning experience catered to each student and their needs, 
And we're leveraging technology as the vehicle to catalyze that at scale. And so I found my thing, I found my calling. And so I never, there's no kind of one size fits all solution. Everyone's different. So um, I say that as um, a disclaimer before any advice, but I think be authentic to you and your needs and it's never going to be easy. Um, I'm just a very cup half full person. I was recently having dinner with our first Curious Cardinals mentors earlier this week. And they were like, do you have any regrets? Do you ever miss Stanford? And I'm like, I love Stanford. I love my friends. I love classes. So more like Audrey could have walked down that path and would have loved it and been happy and amazing. And I walked on this path instead and I'm growing and learning and frankly growing at a more exponential rate than I ever have before and making an impact. And it's not easy and it can be isolating and it was probably most difficult at the beginning, um, but I love it. I'm so grateful. So I think everyone, every to each their own, um, don't recommend it for everyone. Um, and I would say it, it, I like everything, it comes with, trade-offs and a lot of sacrifices. I think what is so core to that is that authenticity piece and that passion, like having a true passion and a calling to be able to say, you know what, I am going to devote, you know, my life to it in a way, like you said, so many sacrifices. And before I want to go into, before I get to AI and education, because it is such a big topic right now, and I'm so curious how you're thinking through it, but I want to know what are the biggest challenges? It's your first company, you know, what has been probably the hardest parts that people don't realize in founding a company? Yeah. It's funny when you asked about how you felt when you went home and even, um, leaving Stanford that I kind of was just reflecting on, I've always been someone who's just like, let's find the good. Let's find a silver lining. Like, I don't like complaining. I don't like being upset. Like, let's just move forward and laugh about it or learn from it. And that's all you can do. That's, like one of the single things I will attribute to being able to be an entrepreneur, resilience, moving forward, lifelong learning. It is not easy. I say sometimes it's like going up against gravity every day with a boulder and it's not glamorous and you're going to get a lot of rejections. You're going to face a lot of things that you do, everything in your power, all the inputs you crush and the outputs, not the result you were expecting or hoping for. And all you can do is be resilient um, and kind of stay true to that North star and know that don't give up. You will get there there. If there's a will, there's a way. And, um, I would say that the hardest part is, um, I, I don't know if that's the hardest part. I actually might be my superpower, what I'm really good at, but I think it's what's not talked about enough is just how difficult and how many lows there are. People see the shiny highs and the wins and the fundraises. They don't see all the things that go into that. And so, I feel like just acknowledging that what's most challenging. Um, it's hard. The challenges are what I love. The challenges what push me and what make me grow. So I think if you don't like constantly being challenged and pushed, it's like you, you learn something and then you're suddenly pushed on it. And that happens like once every month. Um, and that's what I love. That's what energizes me. That's what fuels me. Um, and, but it's really challenging and it's really time consuming and, um, and I would say that it come, it requires constant learning. Of course, learning to be a manager, learning to build a team, learning to hire, learning to set strategy, execute on it, set goals, track goals, um, manage our finances, look at the runway in the bank, figure out how we're going to allocate resources, skin capital. Those, a lot of those things are difficult and take a lot of time and effort and you make some mistakes and you get back up to the bat so long as you learn from them. Um, but I would say like big picture um, it's, it's hard how much it pushes you and have to learn, but that's also what I love so much and what energizes me. Whether the hiring, building culture, all of that, was that learning by doing for you? Or did you actually lean on, did you have mentors that were helping you saying, okay, you know, maybe it's time for you to establish cult uh, values for curious cardinals. And, you know, this is what you should look for in hiring. And these are best practices. How, how did you go about all of these new things? One, yes, learning by doing. And that is very much what we believe at Curious Cardinals. Learn by doing. Um, two is I am a lifelong learner. I read a book at least once a month. I listen to podcasts almost every day. Walking to work when I'm brushing my teeth. I rarely have time, but I make the time. I'm constantly consuming content to stretch my mind and learn and learn from experts and those I look up to who've done it before. And then the other element of that is three, finding mentors. 
Um, I would be a crazy hypocrite if I myself didn't practice what I preach. Um, I've been really lucky to find some phenomenal mentors. Um, my main mentors are Curious Cardinals. They happen to be moms and um, users of our product themselves and finding those people who I really look up to and push me and are honest with me because they so believe in me. So combination of learning by doing um, and then finding all the content. There's so much out there. There's so many people who've done what you want to do before or frameworks or advice and reading. Um, and then the third is the mentors, finding those mentors, speaking with them, being honest with them and turning them to push you. Okay, we are at a really interesting time right now with AI, ChatGPT, almost flipped education on its head in a way. And now students are, you know, deferring to ChatGPT to write their essay or whatever it may be. I want you to talk a bit about, I know you've talked to 40 plus events in the last year to parents particularly and teaching them how they can unlock AI for good in terms of educating their kids and helping their kids. Tell me a little bit about that process and what makes you positive about this new wave that we're in. Yeah. So it started in January of 2023. Yeah. Um, one of our advisors, one of those curious cardinals, moms turned friend, advisor, mentor, um, Desiree, she's actually now the CMO at Salesforce AI, calls me and is like, Audrey, you want to change the future of K-12 education? You've got to hop on the AI bandwagon. Remember, I was the STEM insecure, math insecure, non-tech, uh, entrepreneurial scene gal. Um, Alec has always been the one pushing me to embrace technology and um, be on the cutting edge of innovation more. And so when in October of 2022, ChatGPT launched and reached a million users in five days, unprecedented. Um, I might have gone on and tried to prompt and then was like, I don't like this or this is weird and x out. Um, and I was like, okay, I have no excuse. Um, she's totally right. I have to embrace this. This is the type of thing that rigid mindset, be open and curious and like committed to lifelong learning. And I said, I'm just going to allocate 15 minutes every day and play around with this, understand its value, how it can provide me value, how it works. 15 minutes every day for one month turned to at least once every hour in my 12 to 16 hour working days. I use AI constantly. It has optimized my productivity. Then we've taught our whole team how to use it. And we've been able to stay lean and mean and hire way fewer people than we had set out to and do so much more with so much less. And then the, the kind of third aspect of that is we've always had this starry eyed vision for personalizing learning at scale. And we knew there would be certain ceilings we would hit and we'd get there when we get there and we'd figure it out. And working and playing around with this technology felt like, oh my gosh, this starry eyed vision we've always had for personalized learning at scale is now attainable. We probably could not have scaled this five years ago effectively. And the technology is here. And again, all the more reason for this incredibly exciting moment in time. And so we're since been integrating AI into our product and technology. Um, and then, yeah, I can talk more about those AI workshops too, but that was a little bit of my AI journey personally. And what made you even, before we get to the, the parents, what made you think that, you know what, I need to go to the parents about this rather than the kids, for instance? So one of the parents who I was speaking to, um, parents are super users or super referrers. Um, our main channel of growth is word of mouth referrals and organic growth and community events that happy parents host. So I happened to be, I think I was getting coffee with a curious Cardinals mom and she asked me her thoughts, my thoughts on AI. And I started telling her and she was like, Oh my God, would you do a workshop for me and my friends? And I was like, sure. I can do a workshop for you and your friends. So I, a Curious Cardinals mom asked me and I put together a workshop um, and she actually had her kids for part of it there. And I, I did, I started to feel a little uncomfortable, almost like how I imagine teachers feel um, learning about this technology because kids can be mischievous, especially when they're in front of each other, trying to be yeah. cool. Um, and so I also reflected on, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of press right now on Jonathan Haidt's book, The Anxious Generation, the great rewiring and talking about our generation um, and the consequences of social media. And a lot of it was parents didn't know. Parents said, we're tech dinosaurs. We don't need to know this. We don't need to figure this out. And kids left to their own devices resulted in a lot of harm. And so I realized teaching parents, one, this is, you, you need to start at the top. That's where you can make the greatest impact. 
And that's where if parents are informed and educators are informed, that's how we are going to guide the next generation to navigate this in the most thoughtful way. Um, and two, moms are so busy. So I could give them this tool. I could give them genuine value to save them time and optimize their productivity. And that was awesome. Um, and then I would say three, I realized that my perspective is a really unique one. There's not many um, young girls who are wearing bright colors, who openly talk about their ADHD and how they were STEM scared teaching courses on AI. And so I now get DMs or requests for moms to teach AI to them all for the past four weeks, especially after the GPT-40 launch, almost every day, wow. <laughs> all the time. Um, and of course, the, this, the output too was that it, it was a great growth engine. It also helps people learn about Curious Cardinals and a little bit show rather than tell our value. That's amazing. It is so, and it, it, it just shows again that your like curiosity led you there in a way. And like, you're, you're very true to yourself when you say you're a learner, right? Like even spending those 15 minutes a day, because I think you're right. It is daunting in many ways, but you broke it down to say like, you know what, I'll, I'll do little bite-sized pieces and then, and then I'll start to learn even more. So I think that's, that's amazing. Yeah. And so Audrey, I think one thing that I've observed just talking to you is that you've known, you know, you're very driven, goal-oriented, motivated, what has been something else maybe that you've learned about yourself while founding in this wild journey of founding Curious Cardinals? So, so many. I think one, just how much I can learn and grow. And yeah. of course, I still have my life plan and my milestones, but I also am a lot less rigid. I know that things take their place and um, you have to really be aware of what's in your control versus what's not. And I would say even with AI, I probably, I was more averse at first and now my whole thing is Albert Einstein in a pre-digital age said, don't memorize what you can already look up. We are in a post Google era. We are in an AI era and kids are still being asked to absorb and regurgitate what they read in a textbook. And so I say to parents with optimism that this is a call to action. There is now a necessity to raise the bar and transform how we educate, equip, inform, and inspire the next generation. And so I'm incredibly optimistic about that. And I would say that if I wasn't constantly in the pursuit of new knowledge and staying curious and open-minded, I wouldn't have come to that conclusion and wouldn't have built that philosophy. Um, and so I think just um, being aware of how the, the bound, there's no boundaries to what you're capable of learning and what you're capable of grow the areas your area capable of growing. So that's one element is the learning aspect, of course. And then I would say two is the mentality, um, like athletics. It's so much about the mindset and so much about your resilience and belief in yourself and belief in the vision you have and your resilience to kind of come back to the plate, come back to your computer the next day and keep at it. Um, and then of course, third, it's all about the people. You are who you surround yourself with. You're the sum of the people you surround yourself with. And so I think we've learned so much about how invaluable it is to build the best team with the top talent, um, surround yourself with the best advisors. And so I think that's another big thing, just how much it matters who you surround yourself with. And yeah. you, can, you can't do this Herculean effort on your own. So, so much credit to my amazing team. Um, and so grateful to have such an amazing team and to have learned how important all the people you built this with are. Absolutely. I love it. So, okay. I have a few more fun questions, if you will. But even first, how do you actually take care of yourself, your mental wellness, if you will. Do you meditate? Do you, what are some practices that you do to ensure that that stays good? Um, do the things that make me happy, curious, Audrey. I love running. Um, so I run or exercise most days and that's really important. I will put it on my Google calendar and make sure to prioritize that that doesn't drop even when work is crazy because that makes me happy. That makes me feel energized. That makes me feel good. Um, I also find love reading. And similarly, I can be super busy and just 15 minutes at night before I go to bed, not be on my screens is really um, restorative for me and nourishing for my mind and soul. Um, and I would say I am such a planner and my weekdays are so planned. One big thing I've, I've done in the past, I would say two years is try to make as few plans as I can on weekends. 
that's hard for me. I'm really intentional. And especially if I'm visiting New York, where I have a lot of friends I have to see, I definitely mm-hmm. break that rule. Um, and I, of course, like to see people, but it, I try to do it more spontaneously now just because my life is so planned. Um, so I think like creating space for rest and creating space to be alone as someone who's so social and always go, go, go. Um, that's been a kind of new um, mentality for me to operate in. And that's been really, really important for me to get the rest I need to come back at it Monday and feel energized in my yeah. best self. And you mentioned you love to read. So I want to know if you had the power to assign a book to everyone on earth to read and really understand, which book would you choose? That's a hard one. I can give like very specific type of person a book. Um, <laughs> like I would say everyone who's a, a builder should read Creativity Inc. By oh, Ed it's Kaplan. a good one. Yes, I've actually oh, read that. It's great. I love that. Maybe I just I just read in January when breath turns to air that hopefully would make people feel all the more intentional about their precious time here yeah. um, and more grateful about how precious life is um, and hopefully more motivated to live their life most intentionally, both in terms of the work they do, the impact they have and the relationships they make. I love that. Such a good one. OK, my final question for you, Audrey, is what craft are you spending a lifetime honing? Communication skills. Ooh, that's a great one. Writing, public speaking. I have no shortage of ideas. Um, So I always tell people my AI workshops, I really use AI for idea generation. I have too many ideas, but brevity is a weakness. Um, Working on being more succinct. And I think communication is the most powerful skill because you can have all the brilliant ideas, um, but if you don't know how to communicate them effectively, if you don't know your point across, you can only go so far with that brilliance, with those ideas. And so I think I'm constantly trying to improve my communication, both written and oral, um, to be the best and most effective communicator and storyteller I possibly can. I love it. Well, Audrey, it has been such a pleasure. You are so inspirational, inspiring to people. And I really, I'm just so excited for people to hear this amazing story. You really took it As you said, you made lemonade out of lemons in this time where, you know, people were scared and didn't know what the world was going to be. And you really just like made this incredible opportunity that has come out in so many great ways and has impacted so many people. So thank you for that. Thank you for coming on the podcast. It's been an awesome. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for all the thoughtful questions. Loved our chat today. Thank you so much for listening to the show this week. If you enjoyed, please spread the word. Tell someone about She Leads or post about it on social media and tag us. If you want to contact us, feel free to send over a message through the She Leads Instagram page at sheleads.show. If you want to follow us on Twitter, our account is at sheleadsshow and mine is at Carly Malatsky. This episode was produced and edited by Nick Fershow. Thank you also to our partner, Floodgate. If you're passionate about startups and want to learn more about the starting journey of those who have built groundbreaking companies, I highly recommend listening to Starting Greatness with Mike Maples Jr., the founding partner of Floodgate. He has an incredible show that, in my opinion, is definitely worth your time. Thanks again.